Okay. NC State, this is North Carolina A&T. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm here with Dr. Dugan, and he says that they only have a local seminar, so I'm going to disconnect from the video conference, okay? Okay, you got to do whatever you want. Just let's start, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, we're going. You can start anytime. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have here uh, uh, with us Dr. Bobak Hasibi from uh, Caltech. Uh, Dr. Hasibi is a professor and executive officer in the electrical engineering, uh, uh, I guess, department. It's department, a department now? Yes, it's a department. Okay, at the, at the California the Institute of Technology, where he's been uh, since uh, 2001. Prior to that, he was a member of technical staff at the math uh, science research at uh, Bell Labs in Murray Hill. And uh, he graduated from Stanford, student of Kai Lab. Uh, his research interests are very broad and span uh, different areas of communication, signal processing, and control. And he was a recipient of a very prestigious uh, the David Lucille Packard Foundation Fellowship and also of the NSF uh, PK's uh, award. And uh, he'll talk to us about uh, Lossy Networks today. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid, for the kind introduction. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, beautiful weather today. Uh, it was, it's nicer here than it was in Southern California. Anyway, um, yeah, so as I mentioned today, I want to talk about um, control over lossy networks. And in particular, I want to talk about an interplay between coding and control. Um, and I should mention that this is joint work with my graduate student, uh, Teja Sukavasi, who just very recently graduated. Okay, so without much further ado, here is kind of the outline of what I want to do. It's a little packed, and so I might skip things here and there, but anyway, this is the, the intention. So I'll spend the beginning saying a few words about information theory and coding theory. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this, but I'll just review. And so those of you who, who know this stuff, I hope I don't bore you too much at the beginning. Then I'll say something about control theory. And these were really two theories that developed more or less independently. Um, and I think you know now with the, the, with the technological pro progress that we have and the way things are set, that you know we, it, it's, it's ripe for more interaction between these two fields. And that's really what I want to talk about um, uh, in the next part of the talk. So we'll look at the interplay between control and communication. So when you want to actually control a system, over communication links. What are the questions that arise? And it turns out it'll be related to an area called interactive communications and something called tree codes. I'll talk about that. Um, this was something developed by Leonard Schulman uh, in the early 90s. Then we'll look specifically at the control problem. Um, and so this is kind of prior work. The main contribution of this talk is a construction of tree codes. And I'll uh, describe what that is, what that means, what the consequences are, and then we'll look at some examples, and then I'll wind up with a conclusion. Okay, so let's start off talking a little bit about information theory. So I'm sure most of you have taken a course, or maybe at some point take a course on information theory. And so single-user information theory, going back to Shannon, deals with the question of reliably transmitting information over an unreliable channel. So you have some channel. You know, um, it's unreliable, meaning that when you transmit an input x, the output y is not determined. All you know about it is a conditional distribution. So when I send x, there's some um, distribution for y that I can expect, and it's given by, uh, by that function there. And so that describes the channel. Um, so it's a noisy channel, if you will. And what Shannon really showed was that even though you have a noisy channel, you can actually do reliable communication up to a rate called the capacity and give a formula for it. Now, the key idea behind what Shannon did is something called block coding. Okay? And if you think about it, the 
the intuition behind it at a very high level really is this. Whenever you have a random channel like this, the behavior of the channel over a single use is, is not really predictable, right? So if this were a channel and you were, say, transmitting bits, zeros and ones here, and every now and then the channel would flip a bit, um, you can't really predict precisely what will happen. However, the observation is if you use this channel many, many times, then you can begin to predict things. So for example, if you know your channel flips a bit with probability p, then you know, if you use the channel many, many times, say n times, you, know, you can with uh, very high confidence say that I'm going to observe np errors. Okay, so you can say things like this. And so if you can somehow construct a code that protects you against np errors, that means I can sort of reliably communicate. So this is at a very high level what the intuition is. The idea is block coding. And you know, coding theory has developed based on that. Again, this is a math heavy slide. I won't go through it. But in coding theory, you have some collection of bits called the message, say m bits, little m bits. You map them to a longer sequence of bits, n bits. The coding rate is called m over n. So if I map to twice as many bits, it's a rate one half code. So I'm adding redundancy. And then I send this, these n bits across the channel. I do some kind of decoding. And basically what you can show is that if you choose the codes appropriately and if the rate is below the capacity, then as you know, the block length goes to infinity, the probability that I actually mistake um, the output or, or excuse me, the transmitted code word goes to zero. So this is kind of, again, the idea is block coding. You take a message, you encode it to something larger, and in the limit, things are fine. You get reliable communication. Okay, so that's the theory, and it's an elegant theory, and it's the right abstraction, if you will, to, to understand these things. But if you think about it, you know, what it really says is that information theorists live in asymptopia, right, in this regime where things can go to to infinity. Um, uh, as I said, we have to assume that we have asymptotically long delays for this to happen. Um, and this is really for the following thing, because on the encoding side, you can only start to encode after you have all the information. You need your m bits. Um, and decoding, again, can only be done after you've observed all the outputs of the channel. Okay? So there is this delay that goes along with this. Um, okay, so that's kind of the theory. In practice, of course, people worry about, you know, the probability of error because in practice you deal with finite length codes and that gets you into this whole area of coding theory where there are algebraic codes, there are graph-based codes, you know, even as recently there's new developments in coding theory. There's something called polar codes. You know, I won't go into any of this, but the bottom line is that it's more or less 60, 65 years since Shannon's work. And in many situations, we now have practical codes that come close to the Shannon limits. So we know a lot of what to do. Okay? Now, that's again all nice and fine. But a, a critique of this whole framework, perhaps, and I think, you know, maybe people think it's a philosophical critique, but was present early on was that in Shannon's framework, um, you know, his definition of information did not involve the notion of time. Okay? So the way you quantify information, if I tell you, you know, a certain event has occurred, the way I quantify how much information it is that you gave me really depended just on the probability of that event. Okay? So if I tell you it's raining outside, I don't know what the usual weather in North Carolina is like, but if it's an unlikely event, that there's a lot of information there. If it isn't, there's not a whole lot. And so it doesn't really depend on when this knowledge is revealed to me. But in practice, you know, it might, right? Because, you know, if you tell me right now that it's raining outside, you know, I have no time to get an umbrella or a coat or anything like that. Um, so it's not as useful to me. But if you tell me like the day before, before I come here from California, then I will prepare myself. So at some intuitive level, you think that time should play a role in how we quantify the value of a piece of information. But in Shannon's definition, it doesn't. Um, uh, and so that's something that we'll see in a moment. There are applications where time actually matters. Again, I can talk more about it, but in the interest of time. And so 
a situation where it matters is in control theory. Okay? So in control theory, again, I apologize, you know, my you know, this is about as high tech I can get in terms of drawing pictures. So we have a plant and we have a controller. So this is some dynamical system. It has an output that's seen by the controller, and the controller gets to influence the behavior of the plant through an input. Um, and so we want to design this controller so the plant has some desired um, behavior, the overall system. It's stable, it has some performance that we want. Okay? Now the reason why control theory, even though, you know, like communications, it deals with signals, you observe signals, you generate signals, um, it, it kind of developed independently, um, is because the constraints were somewhat different. In control, this controller has to generate control inputs on the fly. Okay? It can't, you know, sit here and observe, you know, you know, lots of lots of um, outputs of the plant and then decide what the controller is because by that time the plant may have done, you know, something else. You have to respond immediately, okay? And if you, you know, introduce delay by observing, you know, the plant longer than necessary, then the performance can degrade because you're reacting too slowly um, to the plant, okay? And as I said, you know, there's a very rich theory that's also developed for, for control theory. Again, as I said, it developed parallel to the information theory stuff. You know, there's things like LQG control, Kalman filtering, H infinity control, and so on and so forth. And the reason why people could kind of study control theory without, you know, appealing to any information theoretic concepts was because early on in most of the applications of control theory, the controller and plant were kind of co-located. You know, you're controlling an aircraft and the controller was on board. And so, you know, you could pretty much measure, uh, you know, the output of the plant and you could imply your, your control directly. Okay? But nowadays, you know, increasingly we have applications where the plant and the controller are not co-located. Okay? You have some system you're trying to control, maybe some autonomous system, whatever. Your controller is somewhere else. Maybe they're connected through the internet, um, some other type channel. Um, there are applications, for example, smart grid, you know, you might have different generators or whatever in the network and control is done somewhere else and you have lossy signaling between them, okay? And so this is a situation where control and communication kind of um, live together, okay? And so the question here is, is what should we do? Now, if you show a picture like this to a communication theorist, what they would say, oh, okay, lossy channels, I know how to deal with lossy channels. I'll just do coding and I'll make these things lossless. Right? In communication, whenever we think of coding, we think of coding as a mechanism that takes a lossy, noisy channel, converts it to a lossless channel. Okay? But in the control context, that often won't work because as I mentioned, you know, the use of block codes to make channels reliable introduces a lot of delay, and in a control system, you may not be able to tolerate that delay, okay? Because the encoder here, as I said, has to observe a lot of measurements of the output before it can begin to encode, and the decoder here will have to wait until it receives everything before it can even begin to encode anything of what it saw. And same if we have a channel between the controller and the plant. Okay, so we can't do um, conventional um, coding, it won't work. Um, the control theorist, on the other hand, will kind of look at it differently and say, okay, I have these lossy channels, let me live with them. Um, but let me try to do the optimal control that I can do. And this is work that Sinapoli did in 2005. And so he assumed that you had, say, erasure channels here. So you have the output of the plant, and now every now and then, randomly, some of these outputs are dropped. So, so think of per perhaps a situation where you look at the output of the plant, you quantize it, you put it in a packet, you send the packet across the internet or whatever, and every now and then a packet is dropped. Okay? And you can design the optimal controller for this, a controller that makes the optimal use of whatever it receives. And you can show that if, depending on what the plant is, if too many packets are dropped, you cannot stabilize the system. Okay, that was the work of Sinapoli. He showed that there was a strict threshold for the drop probability that made the system unstable, no matter what control you used. 
Okay, and so the question is, in, in such a setting, what can you do? So traditional control doesn't work. You know, making the channels noiseless via block coding again um, doesn't work. Okay, so that's kind of the question I want to address in this talk. Um, for example, what do we need to do to guarantee the stability of the closed loop system? Okay, so is the setting clear? This is what we want to look at. And again, this is a cartoon version, but you can think of much more complicated versions of this where you have many plants, many controllers, the whole network stuff connected through lossy channels. Okay, so it turns out that the answer to this question comes from the answer to a more general question called interactive communications. Okay, and so let me explain uh, what a two-party communication system is. Okay, so in Shannon's setting, we have a transmitter and a receiver, and everything goes in one direction. Okay, in a two-party communication system, say Alice and Bob as the convention is. So Alice has some message X. Think of it as a bit string. Bob has another one Y. Think of it as a bit string, and you know they want to perform some interactive communication, some protocol. So perhaps you know. Um, X is a bit string, it represents an integer. Y is another bit string representing an integer. And say they want to compute the GCD of this integer. Okay? And the way communication works is, you know, they have to communicate over short bursts. So it's not as if Alice can send all of X to Bob and then Bob computes the GCD and sends it back. They have to, you know, communicate in short bursts. So in the first round, Alice transmits, say, some signal to Bob, which is a function of um, uh, X, the message it has. Bob receives that, transmits something back to Alice, which is a function of what it has and what it observed from Alice. And then Alice does the same, so that's allowed to be a function of S2, and this goes on. So it's a protocol. It's a conversation. If you will. Okay, and so people in, for example, communication complexity worry about the question, say, if you want to compute the GCD, what is the minimum communication you require to do this and so on. Okay? But the question that we want to look at in this talk is can you do a protocol like this reliably over noisy links? Okay? So if these links were noisy, say Alice was transmitting S1 to Bob, Bob won't receive S1. It'll receive something else, right? a noisy version. And so the question is how does that influence what Bob does and do these errors, will you screw up as a result of these errors? Okay? Can you still compute, say, the GCD of these two numbers? if the channels over which Alice and Bob are communicating are now noisy. Okay? And again, because communication is done in short bursts, and it's interactive, you cannot do block coding. In other words, I cannot reliably encode S1 because I don't have enough channel uses to do that. Okay? So it's a different paradigm. And so Leonard Schulman, in his PhD thesis, kind of answered this question. Um, and he did it through something called a tree code. Okay, and so that's what I'll try to describe here. And so a tree code is called a tree code because it looks like a tree. Um, it's really a causal encoding function, and so let me describe that. So this, the tree code is a semi-infinite DRE tree. Semi-infinite meaning this tree goes on forever. It starts somewhere, but, so it's semi-infinite, but it never ends. It's DRE in general. DRE meaning that you know, each node has D children. Okay? So if it were a binary tree, there'd be two. Um, and then each edge here has a label. And you label it with an element from um, some alphabet of size D prime that's strictly bigger than D. So here in this case, I have four edges. And so maybe I'll choose an alphabet of size 8. And, you know, I will, you know, label these edges, you know, with symbols 1 through 8. Okay? So, so it's a tree along with these labels. Okay? And so the way this works as a code is the following thing. It maps semi-infinite sequences to semi-infinite sequences, where the input semi-infinite sequence has elements in, the, in an alphabet of size D, the output semi-infinite sequence has elements in an alphabet of size D prime. Okay, and so the way it works is this. So if I, if I want to encode a sequence to a sequence, I'll look at, say, S1. If S1 is 2, 
then I look at the second branch here, and I look at whatever label it was, and that becomes C1 for me. That becomes the output. Okay, and then since I've taken this, if I now look at the second element, it's say S4, I look along this branch, and I output what the label of that is. Okay, and so I just go down this. And the reason why it corresponds to a tree is because this map is causal. So any two sequences that are identical up to some point will have identical outputs, right? Because they inherit the same path in a tree up to that point. With a block code, that's not true. If you have two inputs in a block code that agree, say, on the first five inputs, the first five outputs won't necessarily be the same. But um, with a tree code, that's the case. And we want this because we want it to be causal. Right? In other words, the output at a particular time i depends on where I am in the tree. And where I am in the tree just depends on what the past was. It doesn't depend on the future. Is that clear? So this is really encoding a causal mapping from S to C. OK? As I said, it's a causal code. Um, each path describes an input, and along with it, describes the output code word two when you look at the symbols on the tree. Is this clear? OK, and so there's a rate associated with this tree, which is just the log of d over the log of d prime. So in the example where you know, there's four here, and if I use an alphabet of size eight, the rate is 2 thirds as an example. OK? So that's what the structure is. But what Schulman insisted, so he used this structure, and I don't have time to go into the details here. We'll see it in a simpler context. He used this structure to show that you know, he could do interactive communications with it, provided a certain property held, which was the following thing. So if you look at two paths in this tree that have um, say some common ancestor, say from the top here. If, the, if I take a look at two paths that have a common ancestor here, and these paths have length n, he required that the Hamming distance between the paths, so when you look at the um, outputs on the edges of these two paths, the Hamming distance should be proportional to n. So the number of times the outputs differ at a certain level of the tree has to be proportional to n. And he insisted that this be true for any pair of paths anywhere in the network that have a common ancestor. So you pick a path where they have a common ancestor, then you go down. And for all depths, the Hamming distance between the two should be proportional to n. If this was the case, then he could make things work. He could make um, the protocol over these unreliable links become reliable. Okay? Um, so that's a property he needed, and he called this a tree code. In other words, this tree structure along with this property. Okay, and what Schulman did was he proved the existence of tree codes. He proved that such things, in fact, exist. So you can have such structures with this property. Um, and as I said, he showed that you could use this for interactive communications. Okay, so it was a very interesting thing, and it's a different paradigm. It's not a block coding thing. It's, it's a tree code. Okay, block codes are good for one-way communications. Interactive communications requires tree codes. Now the problem with, not a problem, but you know, what wasn't done, was that even though he showed the existence of tree codes, he had no explicit constructions. So no one knew how to build a tree code. And he did not have tractable decoding. Nobody knew how to decode it. So in other words, if you observe an output you know, that was a code word coming from a tree code corrupted by noise, how do you go back and figure out what the code word was? Um, and again, for those of you who know stuff about coding theory, so for example, Shannon's work on block codes showed that you know, any random code, random chosen appropriately, if you will, is a good code. So um, almost any random code is a good code. In, in Schulman's case, he's not able to show that. In other words, a random code is not necessarily a good code. So you have to really be clever in terms of how you choose this thing. And as I said, he only showed the existence. Nonetheless, I think it's a very important piece of work. Okay. And then, so a few years later, Anand Sahai, he did a, yes? So, uh, what is the property of the tree codes which make them suitable for interactive communication? Is it just the causality or? No, it's the causality that? along with this, with this Hamming distance property. Again, you'll see it more, I'll, I'll, I'll revisit this in the context of control. And in the context of control, it'll become very clear. 
registers, which are also causal. And that, the, so, so for example, a, a traditional convolutional code, right. say, which is causal, uh, doesn't work because it doesn't have this property. Because n here, so this is semi-infinite. You want it to go on forever. With a convolutional code, after a while, you know, you cannot guarantee a Hamming distance beyond, you know, for every path beyond a certain thing. It has to do with the dimension of the state um, in your convolutional code. So that's, that's really the... So this, this is critical. And you'll see it again more in the context of control, which I want to talk about right now. So Anand Sahai is, again, and it's another MIT thesis from 2001, um, looked at a, a problem in control, um, and I'll tie it back to the tree code in a moment, which is pretty much you know, what I described earlier. So you have a, where is it? Yeah, you have an unscalar, you have an unstable scalar plant you have a noisy channel, and then you want to control it. Um, and so what he proposed to do was to put causal encoding here and causal decoding here, right? And causal because the controller has to make decisions on the fly. Um, and so the way it works is that at each time step, the output of the, the, the plant is quantized to some number of bits, say k bits. It's causally encoded, transmitted across the channel, at every time instant, the decoder will attempt to causally decode what was transmitted to estimate, say, the state of the plant and then generate control signals. And so the question he, he asked was, when can I stabilize a plant like this and what should I expect of my causal encoder and decoder? Um, so those are the questions. And so to address this, and I'll kind of partially address your question, let me look at a very toy example. But I think it's illustrative. So I'll take a very simple dynamical system. So in discrete time, just the first order system. Um, so xi is a scalar state, which is evolving in time according to this equation. A is a coefficient here. I'll assume it's larger than 1. This makes the plant unstable. So the state would grow, right? Expo it grows exponentially at a rate of A. And let me again, for simplicity, assume that the input to this, there's some exogenous input, um, which is random, and let's assume it's just plus one, minus one. Okay? So think of this as being an amplified, if you will, random walk. Okay? And let's assume we know the initial um, condition. And let's assume the, the objective is to track the plant. In other words, I want to track where the state is. And in most control problems, the difficult part is estimation. If you can estimate the state of the plant, you can typically or almost always control it. Usually you cannot control it when you don't know where the state is. So let's just look at the state estimation problem. Okay, so it's clear if somebody somehow at each time instant could provide me with a bit saying whether W is plus 1 or minus 1, I can certainly track the plant because I can, at each time I'll know where we went and I can track. Okay, and so what we want to do is, you know, um, to try to do this over a noisy channel. So what we will do is we will take these bits that represent whether W is plus 1 or minus 1, causally encode them, and send them across our noisy channel. Okay, so the bit sequence will be called B. And at the output of the channel, what we will do at each time, we will attempt to encode the entire bit sequence from the infinite past to the current. So every time I look at the output of the channel, I'll try to figure out what the bits were. Okay? And that estimate I'll call at any time j, b hat of j given i. So I'm decoding at time i, but I'm decoding everything. Right? So um, j, if you will, starts from 0, goes up to i. Because the, the idea basically is this. Um, because I'm causally encoding, the recent bits are not very well protected. Okay, because I haven't had much chance to encode them. The earlier bits hopefully are better protected. Okay, so let's, let's kind of represent that. So I'm going to call P, E of I and D the probability of error that I'm decoding at time I. And, I, and, and this is the probability that the first error um, uh, that I make is actually D time steps back. Okay, so everything before d time steps back has been correctly decoded. Okay, so my estimate is correct. 
I've made no error. And the first error I make is d steps back. So if I put 10 here, what that means is that I know everything in the infinite past correctly. It's on the 10th bit past that I made my first error. Okay, so that's what this is. And with this definition, now we can, for example, look at the mean square error of tracking the plant. So the difference between uh, what the actual state is and what I think it is based on my observations up to time i. Okay? And since, um, you know, if I make a, an error d steps back, I know everything in the past, so I know the state up to time x i minus d perfectly. My error happens after that, and that error I can kind of represent with this formula. At worst, this is what it is, because I do d steps of this unstable plant, and so it kind of behaves like a to the 2d. Okay, if, my, if the first error I made was d steps back, that's what the error is. This is the probability that that effect happens. And so my mean square error is just this infinite sum. And so you quickly realize that if I can guarantee that this probability of error has an exponent that beats the unstable exponent of the plant for all delays, and at every time i, if I can guarantee this, then I guarantee bounded mean square. Okay, so that's what I need. Um, with this causal coding or encoding that I do, I don't require that the probability of error go to zero. I can't do that because I, I can't do block codes. What I need to guarantee is that the further I go back, the chances of my making an error is less and less. In fact, it's exponentially small in the delay with an exponent that beats the unstable exponent of the plant. So I have to be able to overcome the unstable exponent so that's what the toy example is. Um, and so based on this, Sahai defines something called any time capacity. I don't know if I should go into it, but the any time capacity of a channel for some parameter lambda is the largest rate for which when you do causal encoding and decoding, you can guarantee a probability of error that decays exponentially with this parameter lambda as a function of delay. So it's, 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 it goes along with lambda. When you say any time capacity of a channel, you have to tell me the exponent, and this gives you the maximum rate that achieves that exponent. And so the theorem that Sahai had was basically what I described to you. If you have a scalar LTI system, you can stabilize it over a noisy channel. First of all, if you take your outputs and you quantize them to k bits, where k is the log of, this should be a, not lambda, and that the rate be less than the any time capacity for, again, this A. So uh, as long as the exponent beats the uh, unstable exponent of the, of the plant. Okay? And this is where tree codes came in. He used tree codes to prove this. And the reason why for tree codes, going back to your question, we need this proportion to N business is because this is what guarantees that we get exponential decay as a function of d. So it comes from that. So if you don't have that, you'll have an error floor. And we can't live with an error floor because if the plant has this unstable growth, we need something that kills it off exponentially. Okay? So as I said, this is an elegant result, and it's, it's, as a theory, it's almost complete because we know conditions to stabilize an unstable plant over noisy channels. It's through this use of tree codes, and we know tree codes exist. And um, you know, so this work, Shulman and Sahai's work, are 10, 15 years old, but basically it's gone nowhere in practice. And, and the reason is because no one ever had explicit constructions for tree codes with efficient decoding. Again, information theorists also kind of shied away from this because there's actually no hope of computing this any time capacity. You know, it has to, com has to do with computing error exponents, which even in the block coding case is an open problem. And here it's even more um, challenging. And so the question is what to do. And so here is what I want to talk about our contributions, okay? So the tree code I just described to you, you know, I, throw, I showed it to you in terms of a tree. Things become simpler if you think of linear codes, okay? So linear codes essentially can be represented by matrices, either a generator matrix or a parity check matrix. And so 
here is how it works. So these are my input bits. It's a semi-infinite sequence. And these are my output bits. And a linear code essentially is described by a linear, you know, it's essentially described by a generator matrix. Okay, and so here, um, if I have a rate k over n code, each of these b's is k bits, each of these c's is n bits, and so each of these g's, if you will, is n by k. So think of these as being blocks. And it's lower triangular, which represents the causality. So c1 gets to be a function of b1, but only b1. c2 gets to be a function of b1 and b2, but only b1 and b2, and so Okay, so that's all. So in the linear case, all it is is you're just lower triangularizing your generator matrix. And same with the parity check matrix. This is an equivalent representation, saying that all code words satisfy these parity checks. Uh, again, this is causal. And P11 now will be n minus k by n. Because you know, the parity check is kind of describes the orthogonal complement to, to, to G. OK? Um, and so you can actually use Shulman's approach um, to show that linear tree codes also exist. So you can actually do this. Now, perhaps going back to your question, the, the reason why constructing these codes has been difficult is that the requirement is what I wrote here. You can either write it in terms of Hamming distance or you can write it in terms of the error requirement. It's the mm -hmm. same thing. And so you want the error, probability of error, at every time i and for every delay to have this property. Um, and so if you try to use a random coding argument, you know, generate a random code like this and check this, you know, typically the way to do it is through union bound. And so you have to union bound all delays and all times. Union bounding over delays is not a big deal, but over all times, the second union bound kills you. You can never get it to be less than one, which is why Schulman needed a very intricate kind of argument that only proved existence. And so this talk really has only one observation, and it's embarrassingly simple, but it solves the problem. And so sometimes simple observations are all it needs. And so the trick is just to make the code time invariant or topless. So now these blocks are constant along the diagonal. And the reason why this saves the day is because once you have a time invariant code, the code looks the same at every time i. And so you get rid of one of the union bounds. And so you can actually show if you generate a random code, as long as it's toplets and lower triangular, it's a good trick with high probability. And that was it. And it's embarrassing to say that was it, but that's it. And I think, yes? So, uh, is it shown that uh, the, the condition which says the Hamming distance should be at least proportional, is that, is that necessary or is it just sufficient? Uh, for, for the control problem, it's necessary where, because you need an error exponent. Um, You might, I haven't thought this precisely, but you might be able to get around with it. I don't think it will matter a whole lot. But if the number of code words where this is violated is exponentially small, somehow, again, in the distance, it may also not matter. Um, because what really matters, at least for the control application, is this. Um, OK. Um, so that's the trick. So the trick basically is generate a random code. The fact that you made a time invariant gets rid of one of the union bounds and gets rid of the problematic union bound, and so that's it. Okay, so you can show theorems, and I won't you know, parse the theorem. But so for example, if you take you know, a matrix like this, either the generator or the parity check, and just pepper it with you know, random 0, 1s, Bernoulli 1 half, then you get theorems, and there are stronger theorems than this. I'm just giving a simple example. So you take any channel, and if you define something called the Bhattacharya parameter of the channel, so this is a channel that has binary input. Um, there's some Bhattacharya parameter, and then this says that for all rates up to something, you get an error exponent with some exponent beta, where beta has some relationship with what rate you chose. Okay, so there's a trade-off between the rate and the exponent. Typically, the higher the rate, the worse the exponent. 
Okay, but that's really what's what's going on. So tree codes exist. If you tell me the rate, as long as it's below this, I can tell you the exponent that you're going to get. And you can use this to stabilize them. Again, I won't go through. Okay? So so that's a tree code, and it works on any channel. Um, but it needs ML decoding. So the assumption to get that error performance is that you need maximum likelihood decoding. Now, anybody who knows anything about coding theory knows that you cannot do ML decoding. You know, even in block codes where you wait at the end, you can't do ML decoding. A tree code requires you to do ML decoding at every time instant, not just once, but all the time, and for the infinite past. So it looks like this is, again, academic. Uh, you can't do this. But it turns out there's one case when you can do it, and that's when your channel is an erasure channel. So what is an erasure channel? An erasure channel is one where you send bits if it's a bit erasure channel or blocks. If you, so if, if it's, for example, things like internet or a lot of wireless networks that are packet-based are well modeled by erasure channels. You send a packet across a network, it's either received or dropped. So an erasure channel is when you either receive it perfectly or the thing is dropped. Okay? Now for erasure channels, it turns out even for block codes, ML decoding translates to just solving a system of linear equations. You just, uh, at, at the receiver, you look at what you've received, and if you're using a linear encoding scheme, as long as you have enough equations, you can solve for the unknowns, and that's it. So I won't bore you with the details here, but... In the block coding case, as long as the rate is below capacity, which is 1 minus the erasure probability, um, you get enough equations, you can do it. And so there's a generalization in the tree code case. The tree code case is a little bit more complicated because we have a lower triangular uh, constraint on the codes. Um, so it's not as simple, but it still, at the end of the day, boils down to solving equations. So I will... You know, you take the matrix and you multiply with other matrices and linear algebra stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll get a system of equations that you can solve. Okay? And so you can have an efficient algorithm. Again, I won't go through it. You, you, get, you look at your received stuff. Part of it's erased. Part of it is observed. And based on this, you do some stuff, all linear algebra, and you decode. Okay? Um, so I don't have time to go into the algorithm, and it's... It's perhaps not too surprising, but the interesting thing about the algorithm, first of all, um, so the way the algorithm works is, as I said, at every time step, you try to decode the entire past. Now, on an erasure channel, um, if you're able to decode something, it turns out that you know it without error because you've had enough equations to solve it, and once you've solved for it, you know what it is. Um, so basically, at every time, you don't have to keep track of the infinite past. You just have to tr keep track of that portion that you have not yet been able to decode. And I'm calling that D. And so typically, the computational effort to do inversion to find things up to a delay of D is D cubed. And the probability that you, know, you haven't decoded stuff until time D is lambda to the minus D. So the complexity of the algorithm at each time step on average is d cubed times lambda minus t summed over all d. So this is the average complexity. Um, so it's actually fixed um, per time instant. I can talk more about encoding and stuff too, but uh, let me not go into this. So this is as efficient as you can get. Um, uh, so before I go into the examples, just what I want to say. So uh, again, this is not an explicit construction, if you will, but what we do say is that if you generate a random toplets code with high probability, it's a good decode, and for erasure channels, it has a very efficient decoder. Let's look at some examples to see how this thing performs. Okay, so here's an unstable plant. That's the state. That's the exogenous input to the state. Here's the noise. So that's the measurement. It's noisy measurements, and this is the control input. Some parameters with the noise. Um, I'll assume we take the measurements, we quantize them to some number of bits, and we send them across the channel. And let's suppose the probability of erasure on the channel is 0.3. So about a third of the packets are dropped. 
And let's assume that I have 15 bits per measurement to send. So every time I make a measurement, I have 15 bits. And so one thing I need to decide is how many bits should I use for quantization of the measurement and how many should I use for encoding, um, you know, to add redundancy. And so to do this, we can use the theorems I showed. So first of all, we need an exponent that beats the unstable exponent of the plant. So 2 to the minus beta has to be bigger than 1 half. And then if you go, for example, and look at the theorem I showed you a while back, once you've fixed the exponent, it tells you something about the rate. And so translated to this situation, it says that the rate has to be less than 0.4 can't be too high. And so if the rate is less than 0.4, it says that, you know, we have 15 bits available. We have to quantize to at most 5 bits. Because if I quantize, say, to 6 bits and use 9 bits for encoding, the rate is 6 over 15, which is more than 0.4. Okay, so this also tells me about how much I need to quantize at most 5 bits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the measured output, I'm going to quantize it. I can do it either one, two, three, up to four, up to five bits, and then throw a tree code on top of it with the appropriate rate. So this is just showing the plant is unstable, going to 10 to the 29 over 100 seconds. And then when you close the loop with the system that I just described, you can see it's stable. It has this sporadic behavior, but it has become stabilized. And to show better what's going on here, what the plots are, so I'm actually looking at a particular cost, a linear quadratic cost. So it's a cost on the state and the input. And what I'm doing here is I have four sets of plots. So recall that my code construction is random, right? So uh, what I'm doing is I'm generating different instances of codes, and I'm computing, and I'm putting them through the closed loop system, and I'm computing the cost. And then what I'm plotting here is essentially the CDF. So for example, on this blue curve, it says that 90% of the codes that I generated had a cost less than, I don't know, 2,200. Okay? You know, 70% had a cost less than 1,200. Okay, so these are CDFs. And I'm doing it for different values of the rate. So this blue curve has a rate that's 315. So I'm using 3 bits to quantize the, the measurement, and then 12 bits to protect them. And so that, in this case, performs better than the red one, where I'm using 4 bits to quantize the, 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 the measurement, and 11 bits to protect, and so on. And so this is 5. 5 was kind of the, the limit at which I could stabilize this thing. And you can see, when I choose 6 bits, the rate is too high can't stabilize. The cost is going to infinity. Okay, so this is showing you essentially, you know, it, it verifies, you know, what I was talking about in terms of the performance of these things. Yes? The ability of the uh, controller to stabilize the plan, uh, are there uh, solutions for uh, random walk structure? Is no, no, no. This was, uh, so I, the, the random walk structure that I showed you was just a toy example to, uh, you know, give you intuition why we need this error exponent. When it's not a random walk, so when your input, say, is, is random but not discrete, okay, you need quantization. And so the quantization has some effect because the better you quantize, of course, the better things are, but then the less opportunity you will have to protect those quantized bits. And so at this point, it's not really clear whether you want to quantize finely with many bits and use a little bit of protection or quantize coarsely and use a lot of protection. What these simulations show, at least in this example, is that you want to quantize coarsely and protect the bits because this the blue curve has performance that's better than, say, the red and the dashed ones. Okay, that's what this is trying to represent. But in general, it's a difficult question because it gets back to issues of quantization. And I've done a very crude quantizer here. There might be more clever quantizers that I can use. But there's an aspect to this, which is how best to quantize the measurements even before I send them through the tree. And then, you know, one can look at more complicated examples, you know, vector state space models. I won't go through the detail that we have conditions again on when these things can be stabilized. These conditions are not tight unless asymptotically, 
but I won't go into any of that. And so here's another example. This is a more complicated system. Um, again, we have, I think, 15 bits per measurement. 30% of the packets are dropped. Again, we need some exponent in this case to beat 1 half. When you look at the formula, now the rate can go up to 40.43. So k can now go up to 6. So you can quantize up to 6 bits. And again, this is, again, the same type of CDF. So this is the LQR cost. Again, so this is the 90 percentile, so stuff below here give costs less than that. And so here what you can see, so the best curve is probably the black curve, which is this. So in this case, it turns out that the best was to finally quantize, because this is quantizing to 5 bits. This one is only quantizing to 2 bits. So it really depends on the system in terms of whether you want to quantize finely and protect them less or, or not. Um, and so we haven't really explored that trade-off in its entirety. Um, do I have five, six more minutes? Yeah. Okay, so I want to shift gears a little bit. So that was the application in control. Um, and the reason why, again, tree codes came up as you know, the way they did in control is because even though people don't think of control as being a protocol, control is a protocol. There are two parties. There is the plant, and then there is the controller. And so the controller, the way they interact is the controller looks at the output of the plant, sends a control signal. The plant looks at the control signal at its own internal exogenous input and generates an output. Okay, so they are interacting, and they both have strict rules in terms of how they interact. The control knows what its rule is, how it maps you know, inputs to control measurements. And the plant also has a strict rule it adheres to. It knows how to generate outputs based on the input coming from the control. Um, and so people in control theory know how to stabilize a plant, and you can think of that as a protocol. So the usual protocol is they interact in such a way that the plant is stable or that it has a certain LQR cost. And so what we care about here is can we maintain this protocol in the presence of noisy channels? So when packets are dropped, and that's what this tree code is doing. It's showing that under conditions you can still stabilize the plant. You can perhaps maintain a certain LQR performance despite having these noisy channels. Okay? But tree codes can be used to implement any interactive protocol. So this control is just an example. And, and here I want to give you another example, which is the problem of distributed consensus. Um, probably should have had a picture for this. But so the idea is, is think of some graph. You have a bunch of nodes. And each node has some real number, knows some real number. And what the nodes want to do is they want to agree. They want to get to consensus on the mean of all these numbers. That, that's what they want to do. But they want to do it with local interactions, OK? And so the typical way you get consensus, if I'm sitting here and if I have two neighbors, um, I'll look at my value, I'll look at my neighbor's values, and I'll average them. And after I've done that, I will send this average to my neighbors and we'll continue. So we just constantly update our values to the average of ourselves and our neighbors. And it turns out that if you do this, you converge, you can prove, you know, if, if the graph is connected and all that kind of stuff, that you will converge, in fact, exponentially fast to the true mean and at a rate that has to do with the second largest eigenvalue of some Laplacian or whatever, uh, of, of, the, of the graph, okay? Um, now, suppose I wanted to do this over erasure links. So suppose we're some wireless channels now. And what happens now if I transmit, say, my value to Hamid, uh, Professor Krim, um, that may get dropped, okay? And since, you know, erasures are asymmetric, you know, maybe he doesn't get my packet, but I'll get his. And so once you do this, you know, all bets are lost. The, you can show that you'll still get consensus, but you might convert to something that's not the mean because things are sporadically lost depending on what the erasures are. Things can go wrong. Um, and so tree codes can be used to fix this. And so here's a simulation. So I looked at a network of 20 nodes that were in a line topology. So just a simple topology. 
networks are on a line, and so as a result, you have two neighbors, unless you're at the very end where you have one neighbor. Again, 30% erasures. So everything starts off with some value between 0 and 1. The black curve, if the colors can be seen, shows, so these guys here, they implement the algorithm I just described. They just transmit stuff. Sometimes packets are dropped, but you just average what you receive from your neighbors. And you do get to consensus, but not to the true mean. The true mean is actually here. And you can see it's kind of exponential. The red curve is when you do this with a tree code. I haven't again described how it is, but with a tree code, um, essentially what's happening is you know, you're transmitting stuff, but you won't update your thing until you're sure you have data from everyone going D steps back, and then you will. And the tree code will allow you to do that. And in this case, you actually, you know, the convergence is a bit slower. You know, here it's, you can tell that it's a bit slower because this hasn't tightened as much as that. But you get convergence to the true mean. So you can actually implement the performance of the noiseless system at a price, which is that things are a little bit slow. Okay? Um, and so you can prove a general theorem, and this will be the last result that I will show you, that if you have any graph with asymmetric erasure links, so you have these erasure links on them, um, and let's assume this graph has some maximum degree delta, that's the only parameter of the graph that will matter, then what it basically says, if you use a tree code of a particular rate r that has a particular exponent that is just larger than 2 log of 1 plus delta, then you can essentially implement the same protocol at a slowdown. So it slows down by you know, an amount, which is r times rho. So r is already less than 1, rho is less than 1. So for example, um, here the slowdown was I guess a, a fraction of 6. Um, so you can quantify what the slowdown is. There's a formula for it. Um, and the interesting thing about the formula is it only depends on the maximum degree of the graph. And so in some sense, this is a powerful theorem because it tells you no matter what the graph is, you know, I can implement the protocol and I can tell you what the slowdown is explicitly, and it only depends on the maximum degree. So in some sense, this is a strong theorem and a weak theorem. It's strong because the only information it requires from the graph is the maximum degree. It's also weak in the sense that the bound might be off because, you know, the graph structure might play a bigger role in it, you know. I mean, uh, for particular graphs, you might be able to do much better than this. Okay, so let me kind of um, summarize and end in the next couple of slides. So what is it that we showed? Um, so we developed a universal and efficient method for stabilizing plants, again, driven by bounded noise over erasure channels. Now, I didn't talk about this stuff, but the bounded noise part is critical. If you have Gaussian noise, all bets are off. Um, again, I don't think that's too much of an issue because I don't think we really encounter Gaussian noise in reality, right? We never hit by the way off in the tail of the Gaussian noise. We're more likely to be hit by a comet than you know, seeing like 10 sigma out there. Anyway, um, so, so it's for about, you know, um, as I said, uh, we've done it for erasure channels, which is probably the most practically interesting case because in a lot of these network systems, everything is packet-based. So you take measurements, you quantize them, you put them in packets, and packets are either dropped. Um, so that's what we did in terms of other stuff that needs to be done. As I said, we just look at stabilizing the plant. Performance is another issue. I showed you some plots, kind of showing in some cases it's good to quantize coarsely, some cases good to quantize finely. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of understanding the trade-off between the communication and control resources and, and what to do, uh, how to do these things best. Again, I only here looked at the erasure channel. Um, we don't have efficiently decodable tree codes for other types of channels, AWGN or binary symmetric. Um, and these appear to be much more challenging because for these types of channels, you cannot do ML decoding. And so you need surrogates for ML decoding, but you need surrogates that still give you an exponential decay, and that appears to be the difficulty. And I can talk much more about that if anyone's interested. Um, and so to conclude, 
as I said, traditional information theory lives in asymptopia, and so it's not appropriate for the real-time constraints um, that one has in control theory. And control theory, on the other hand, has long ignored information theory. And so I think this problem of controlling plants over communication links is a place where the two um, areas can meet and date and maybe become fiancés or something. But um, the key object, as I said, is a tree code, which essentially is a causal code with a certain Hamming distance requirement. And it's a new paradigm. It's different from the block coding paradigm. Um, and again, just uh, repeating what we showed, we showed the existence of linear tree codes with high probability and for erasure channels gave efficient ML decoding. Um, as I said, this opens up many possibilities both for control, for implementing distributed protocols over lossy networks. I think it opens up a lot of things. Um, at, at some level, you know, maybe the message to take away from all of this, if you think of what coding does in communications, what coding does in communications is it takes an unreliable lossy link and replaces it with a perfect link. That's at the highest level what we think coding does for us in communication. In control, in these real-time constraints, what coding does for you really is it takes a lossy link, re replaces it with a lossless link, but a lossless link that has random delay. Okay? So when you code in a real-time setting, you're guaranteeing that all your packets will get across. Nothing will be dropped, but you can't guarantee the delay. You might get them late because you might have to wait a while before you can decode it. What you can guarantee is the profile of the delay. Okay? And so in controlling an unstable plant, what you require is that profile, that exponential decay, beat the unstable exponential growth of the plant. Um, in, for example, this uh, consensus problem, that profile, the error that you get in the profile, kind of represents how quick you get to consensus. But at a very high level, the thing to remember is that what coding can do in control is replace a lossy link with a lossless link with random delay. So I will stop there. Thank you. Yes, Saba. Uh, can we use this model for nonlinear plants? I would uh, think that you can. The problem is that I don't know of any theorems, at least on the top of my head, that would give you conditions. You know, so you would need a condition similar to, um, you know, Sahai's basic theorem saying that, um, where is Sahai's theorem? You would need something like this that relates the, you know, the probability of error where is it? Yeah, this should be, again, A, that relates it to the property of, of the plant. So if you have a nonlinear plant, um, again, I'm not an expert on nonlinear control, and so I, you know, it would have to do something with, you know, what the, the um, instability on the nonlinear plant is. Now, it could be if you have a nonlinear plant with saturation or whatever, stuff like that. If the instability growth is sub-exponential, which sometimes nonlinear plants are, you might be able to get away with things that are not even exponential. Okay? That's one thing. The other thing that I should mention now that you have said all of this, you know, I was kind of, you know, because I was trying to get the main issues across, so I was a little sloppy at times. And one of the, not sloppy, but I wasn't telling you the whole story. So, for example, here, when I talked about mean square, you know, in, in these stochastic settings, when I talk about stability, I have to mention the sense in which I mean it's stable. And so, for example, if what I care about is mean square stability, you know, the square of A shows up. And so the exponent of the error really has to beat A squared. Okay? If I cared about absolute stability, an absolute value here, then I only have to beat A. If I care about stability in higher moments, then, you know, I have to be even more strict in how this is decaying. And if I want stability in every moment, then I can't do it. There's no code that would do that. So, yes, yes, yes. So I kind of glossed over that. Um, so in addition to, 
the so I haven't thought about the nonlinear stuff, but even in the stochastic setting, you know, you have to say what kind of stability it is. Okay. Um, if I have time, there's one other issue I also glossed over, which um, has to do with let's see, I can show it here. Um, the encoding complexity. Um, so the decoding complexity is not a problem because once I've decoded something in the past, I can throw it away. Um, so I'm usually just dealing with some finite something at all times. The encoding complexity, on the other hand, grows because I have to remember everything, right? And this matrix, as I go down, it's semi-infinite, gets fatter and fatter. Um, so you don't want to really do that ever, do you? Um, and so the way around that, and this I think can be implemented on most systems, is you occasionally need feedback. In other words, every now and then the controller has to tell the plant, you know what, I know everything up to 20 time steps back or 100 time steps back. You don't need to. And so they can jointly agree to zero out everything before that. So if the encoder knows how far back the decoder has decoded, then it doesn't need to carry the rest of the bees. They can both agree, let's assume these bees were zero, throw everything away. And so in order to control the encoding um, complexity, you need occasional feedback from the receiver you know, to tell him, that, okay, I know stuff this far back. Don't, don't carry all the bees um, to the infinite past. So that's one thing you need. Um, another comment I would like to make is, if you look at the other extreme, which in many wireless systems is the case, where you have ARQ. In other words, in, in the usual internet, the way things work is with every packet that you send comes back an acknowledgment. Okay, that's how TCP IP works, right? You send these packets, the acknowledgments don't come, you resend or whatever, and you change your window sizes and all that. Um, so if you have an erasure channel, say in the simplest case, where I'm transmitting packets, and if I got instantaneous feedback, as to whether the packet was received or not. I don't need to do any kind of encoding. I'll just repeat the packet until you know, it's received. Um, <coughs> and so if you do this, you can analyze again. You're going to get an exponential decay in the delay, right? Because the chances that I will need D transmissions before, you know, the fact that all D transmissions are erased decays exponentially, right? And it'll be. I don't know, one minus epsilon to the d, or epsilon to the d, whatever. Um, so it's not surprising that what I said earlier, that you can take a lossy channel and replace it with a lossless channel with delay. You can do that when you have feedback, instantaneous feedback, just by retransmission. And so what this tree code stuff is telling you is that you can guarantee the same thing. In other words, you can make a lossy channel lossless with some delay, but without that feedback. You know, so the, the transmitter need not know whether you've received stuff or not. The only way in the tree code case that it would help to know would be in cutting down the encoding complexity. I'm sorry, your question I took too long. Yeah, I, I, think, I think if you have any questions, maybe we can take them offline uh, because they have to stop taping. Uh, let's thank our speaker again.